Join us as we sit down with remarkable individuals from various walks of life who face their fair share of obstacles and emerge with positivity. Each episode, you'll hear inspiring stories, actionable tips, and wisdom that can supercharge your own journey when using adversity as motivation. Let's learn together. Welcome to Lauer Power. Welcome, friends, to another edition of Lauer Power, where we use adversity as motivation alongside Chad Lauer. My name is Chad Evans, the guy who pushes the buttons, and Chad Lauer actually does the real work. (laughs) I don't know about that, man. I I couldn't live without you. Everybody who knows me knows I am not the -the behind-the-scenes type of guy, so I I really appreciate it. Well, I'm happy to push your buttons, pal. (laughs) And I also want to remind everybody, while you're here, please do us a favor and go ahead and click on that subscribe button. We do appreciate you doing that. Thank you. Yeah, I'll tell you what, we actually, once we finally started asking for subscribers, I think we're, you know, we've, we've gotten like 20, 20 more last episode. Yeah, okay. So hopefully, then hopefully they keep we'll going. We'll just keep asking to subscribe. Yeah, click on that subscribe button, especially if you're on YouTube. Good for you. You just got back from Jamaica. I did. I'll tell you what. Fancy guy. You you know what? Travel makes me feel alive, man. It it does. Like the difference in (laughs) not coming home. You have a sinus infection. Uh, Every time I get on the, (laughs) every time I get on an airplane, I get sick. So, uh, but but dude, honestly, uh, I try to travel as much as I can. It it makes me feel alive. Uh, I love experiencing other cultures. And it was the first time I was in Jamaica. Yaman, you know, is what they say. No, no worries, man. And um, some of the folks in Jamaica, you know, they don't have much, but they are happy as can be, man. Yeah. It's, it's really a cool experience. So if you ever get a chance to go there, I highly recommend it. Good for you. I'm glad you had a good retreat. Yes. Hopefully next time I can join you. <laughs> but we, we, that's an, we'll save that for another podcast. All yeah. Together. Yeah. We'll, we'll do another podcast. You know what? Listen, you can come on next year's retreat, but we have to video some of our shenanigans. Yeah. That yeah. You want me to work? I get it. I get it. I get it. <laughs> I like pushing your buttons, Lauer. I hear you. We're I hear. You. And listen, our guest today, he likes to push buttons too. He's a leader in the. Uh, he was a twenty-year uh, superintendent at Central Columbia High School, and what we're going to learn from him today is he liked to push buttons too, which made him a pretty good leader. This is going to be really interesting to have an in-depth conversation with uh, someone that's been in the educational realm for so long. Yeah, when we started this podcast, I promised to give you leaders from all different aspects of our life. And, uh, I think that there's so much we can learn from each other. And Harry Matthias is our guest today and he is just awesome. And I think some of the concepts you're going to learn, uh, we can all take those lessons and apply it to our daily lives. Well, let's have a chat with Harry. Before we get started, I started kind of asking our community, about different leaders and you know his name came up in the educational leadership almost from every single person I asked and I think part of the reason why is Central Columbia School District decided many years ago to compete when they set out the criteria to compare data against schools and not only were I think they're the second ranked school in the state of Pennsylvania I think maybe New Hope was ranked ahead of them uh, but we're, they were one of the top ranked schools in the country. So just like we compete in sports, uh, Harry Mathias as the superintendent uh, decided, hey, I want to compete academically and I'm going to go at it full bore. And I I, I certainly respect that. So we're going to learn so much from him. So let me just introduce Harry to you. So he is a independent educational consultant today. He's the owner of the Mathias Educational Leadership Consulting LLC. Um, He also serves as a consultant at the DAC, the Danville Area Community Center. Um, He is involved in the Chamber of Commerce. He also um, is a Bucknell graduate um, and and is involved in so many different organizations. But really, the bulk of his career was spent in the classroom um, as well as a superintendent at Central Columbia School District. So welcome, Harry Mathias. All right. So, Harry, um, thank you so much for joining us on the Lauer Power podcast. Um, you know, I, I'm really excited to chat with you because part of our podcast is about leadership. And even though I'm in the private sector, we've had people who've worked at NASA on. We've had, you know, entrepreneurs, globetrotters, people of all different backgrounds, because I'm a big believer that, you know, together we can learn from each other. Um, and build each other up. So when I asked folks who the best leader in our area was um, in the education sector, um, you know, 
eight of the 10 people mentioned your name. Um, at the time, I really have to be honest, I, I didn't know you that well. Um, and I still don't, but I'm excited to get to know you on, on this podcast today. So just to kind of jump right into it, why do you think that is? Why, why do you think your name comes up in the education sector with your, you know, you're a retired superintendent. Like, you know, if you look inside or look back at your career, why do you think your name comes up when I ask those questions? So first of all, I was around a long time. I was superintendent for 19 years at Central Columbia, and that doesn't happen anymore. And of course, that length of time, you come across a lot of people. Uh, also, I, I wasn't shy. I got involved in things. I was uh, actively involved at the uh, Central Susquehanna Intermediate Unit. I was kind of the regional representative to our state organization. Uh, so I got a chance to meet with a lot of people, talk with a lot of people. So it, so there is that on the, on the surface. But also, uh, if we're looking at it from a leadership role, uh, we very much tried to be cutting edge. Uh, I don't apologize for saying that I tried to be the best. Now, I don't know if that's the best in comparison to others, but or, or in education, it's the best you can be personally. Um, I just felt that I was entrusted to all of these students who were coming through our school. And then, of course, all the resources with the teachers and the curriculum and the, you know, the finances that the board gave us. And if I was going to be responsible for a student, I wanted them to have the best opportunities they could possibly have uh, and did not shy away from it, was unapologetic at that. Um, and I think the things we did got out there and people saw, you know, this guy was willing to take a risk. Uh, willing to be a leader. Um, sometimes uh, that was well received, other times perhaps not as much, but I uh, wasn't shy about it. Yeah. And, and I love that answer, right? It just kind of getting right into it. Your leadership, I can already see just talking with you. It was like, hey, we're going to go here, you know, and I'm going to hold you accountable. And sometimes as a leader, you can't make everybody happy. But I also think in doing some research and preparation for this podcast, I think, you know, um, people probably thought of you as one of the best leaders because Central Columbia School District, when they started keeping score, right, and, and this was years ago, and I'm sure you could elaborate on it, um, was not only a top-rated school district in the state of Pennsylvania, but nationwide. So can you tell us on uh, sort of like, you know, what happened when schools started you know, for a lack of better terms, competing uh, in some of these metrics? And how were you able to use that to, you know, become such a well-known school district in the state and in the country? No, no Child Left Behind passed in 2001. And one of the things that that federal law did is it essentially created a scoreboard for schools. Uh, it mandated testing of students, um, you know, grades three through eight inclusive and in the high school over multiple subjects. Uh, it mandated that be done, but also in addition to that, that those scores be published, that they, you know, become part of the public record. And that was done for uh, very good reasons. It was done because uh, historically some schools were not performing uh, or worse, they were not performing for certain populations of students, you know, so socioeconomic or racial uh, groups, those types of things. And the thought was that if we, we uh, you know, we assess students and made that public, that would make schools uh, accountable. They would, they would focus on those things and so forth. So being kind of a former athlete and former coach, having a scoreboard there didn't bother me at all. In fact, it was, it was, it became a goal. So uh, and by the way, also part of my background, I was a math teacher, so very much um, associated with data, the use of the collection of data and the use of data. And that, of course, is what this uh, assessment system, if you will, did is it provided more data. So, so what we what we did is we kind of you know, grabbed on to the fact that there was going to be this scoreboard. And let's so if, there's, if that's the way we're going to do it, let's play. You know, let, let's let's go at this and do as best as we possibly can do. And then what that made us do is kind of dive in to what are the things that that increases student achievement, because in the end, that's what you're measuring with all this, all these assessments. So in order to get high student scores, I mean, the research is actually pretty clear. It's easy to say it's harder to do, uh, but it's things like having a quality curriculum. 
I mean, an in-depth curriculum where uh, students learn multiple concepts, but also at a deep level. And that that curriculum has to be articulated and you must do it. You can't say you're gonna do it and then the teachers go off and do something else. So we put that in place, we involved the teachers in that, we, the principals and you know, me, I was, took a leadership role and we put that curriculum in place and we would every year measure that to make sure it was happening. We'd observe our teachers, we made sure the curriculum was happening. The second thing was quality instruction. I mean, we have these teachers, we, we talk about uh, the talent that they bring. Well, it's my job as an administrator, as a supervisor, to make sure that quality is happening. So we train the teachers. We determine what a lesson looked like. How would they start a lesson? How often would they review with kids? Uh, how, uh, how would we do summarizing strategies? All those things that increase student achievement, we trained our teachers to do. The third thing was this a high quality assessment system. Now, you know, everybody's taking tests in school and the thing that's most infuriating is a teacher that thinks they're teaching to a high level, but gives a test with true, false and multiple choice questions. Well, that didn't happen in Central Columbia. Every unit assessment that we gave in any grade and in any subject, and I mean math and English and phys ed and agriculture, all those courses, Kids were expected to think, to answer questions, to be able to write. That was expected everywhere. So if you became a student at Central or, or as you worked through the system, you know when you walked into a class that the teacher was gonna have a high level curriculum, they were gonna ask you to do things and you were gonna have a high level assessment system at the end. And then finally, if you have all of that, of course, if you have an assessment system, you're collecting data on students you know what they can do and what they can't do vis-a-vis -vis the standards and so forth. Well, what good schools do is not only collect that data, but they then analyze it. You know, what's it tell you about the student? What's it tell you about your curriculum? What's it tell you about your assessment? But they then utilize this, and this goes to the scientific method, to then go back and make adjustments. Make adjustments for your curriculum. Make adjustments for the students. If you discover that a student is in need of a particular area, do you just ignore it? Or do you put things in place to make that happen? And what all of those things did, I mean, I use the coach metaphor that if to win on Friday night, if I have, if I can block the defensive end and run off tackle, well, I spend all week working on that. And if my tight end needs extra time, well, I'm gonna give him extra time because we're gonna make sure we get that done. Well, that's what the way we would approach our instruction. Here's what you need to do, curriculum. I'm gonna teach you how to do it, instruction. I'm gonna measure how you do it. How did you do on Friday night? And if you didn't do well, we were gonna work more on it and make sure you were better. What that did is it dramatically boosted our students' academic achievement. It was reflected in the scores and it made us a very high performing school. I mean, that is so well said. And, and you know what I love about this is I've talked on previous podcasts, like being tough on people, they actually like it. There's this like, there's this notion out there that like, you know, being tough on somebody is going to make them like leave or being tough on somebody is, is not the way to run your organization. And, and I feel the opposite. I coach basketball. I played basketball in college and, you know, the people who've had the biggest impact on my life are the people who are the toughest on me. <laughs> and like, you know, I think that's okay. So I also worked for a really large company uh, called AT&T for a decade. And we had a union environment um, where, you know, versus an administration, which was non-union. And as, as we think about the education system, how were you able to build a culture of accountability as an administrator in a union environment. This to me is a fascinating topic, right? So can you speak on that? Because you might have employee A who's, you know, negative Nelly, and you might have employee B across the hall who's the best teacher in the world. How do you hold them both accountable when one might be a very, very high achiever and the other one might just be showing up and going through the motions? 
So for, I'll start with that. I, I especially think this is true in central Pennsylvania. Most of the teachers are there for the right reasons. They're there for the kids. They want to work hard. And I would say that's 80 to 90% of the teachers that are there. So uh, already that's, that's a group you can build a culture upon. That's a group that um, uh, it, 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 you, you don't have to motivate. You know, they're, they're motivated themselves, uh, but they're an important part of this whole picture because you are right when you use the word culture. You are absolutely building a culture of success and achievement, uh, quality teaching, quality learning, and all of that. So uh, again, you heard me talk about how we put this high-level curriculum in place. Well, that curriculum was written you know, by the teachers, aligned to the academic standards, but it was expected of all teachers. It didn't matter if you were teacher A or teacher B, A and B were required to implement that curriculum. So we would have monitored that. I mean, there's nothing in the school code that says an administrator can't go in and look at their teacher. In fact, the opposite's true. The administrators are supposed to do that. So we would put in place a plan of how we would go in. We would tell the teachers, this is what we're looking for. We're looking for what it is you're teaching and how we taught you to do that. And we're gonna give you feedback on that. That is a standard supervisor employee relationship that absolutely exists in schools. Administrators just have to take advantage of it. And we would provide feedback. That feedback was designed to make the teacher better. It was not designed to be an I gotcha kind of thing. It was designed to, hey, we're part of this culture, so we're gonna make you better. Um, obviously there are times where some teachers don't come along. They, so what we would do is we would take that data again, think of the scientific method. Okay. We've trained you how to do something. We've asked you to do it. We've watched you collected data, but now we've determined that we got to go back and fix some things. Well, we would put, um, you know, we would train those teachers. We would align them with their colleagues. So we would have a colleague that maybe was really good at questioning techniques, For as an example. We would align them with a teacher who needed help and said, hey, can you guys talk? Can you come observe each other and work together to get better? <clears throat> because we had this culture of success that worked and the union loved it <clears throat> because they were part of the solution they could weigh in with their colleagues and they could help colleagues that were maybe uh, struggling get better. What I found, especially around here, was that teachers not only wanted to be good, they wanted their colleagues to be good. They did not want to be part of a system where they would go out and, like, you know, there's they're a supermarket. Oh, I heard Mr. Smith says this or does that. Well, teacher doesn't want that. They want them to be as good as possible, so they were more than willing to help. There, of course, were times where you had to take some action on things. And this is how I, this is, first of all, unapologetic. I wanted to be able to look a parent in the eye and say, you have a quality teacher and I'm doing everything I can to make that happen. I'm not looking the other way if there's a problem. So I had no trouble uh, confronting an issue uh, if and when that were to occur, but it, it became important that we did that. And this goes to your point, Chad. T th there's reasons that you um, jump in on these. First of all, it's because the person themselves needs the help and wants the help. But the second reason is everybody else is watching. They know what's going on. They recognize when someone may not be as strong. And it's, you know, as an organizational culture, well, are those administrators, is Harry Mathias going to ignore that behavior or is he going to confront it? Let's see. And if I confront it, then it's like, yep, yep, that's going to be part of the culture here. So I don't have a license to slack just because my I think my neighbor is. And, and that's a great answer. Um, I, I, I really, really appreciate that. And I, and I love the way you kind of describe that. So what I have a bunch of questions, obviously, what what can teachers do to actually hold administrators accountable as well? So, you know, I asked you, what can administrators do to hold teachers accountable? What can teachers do if the administrators aren't aren't holding up their part? 
So the value of the teachers in this equation is they, of course, they're where the rubber hits the road. Um, when I sit in my office and, you know, come up with all of this stuff, I'm, I don't have kids in front of me. The teacher has the kids in front of me. They're the most important link in the educational process. Um, you know, a student walks into a classroom and is sitting in a desk right in front of me. This is where it matters. So they are um, necessarily the, the critical part of creating that culture of, you know, the teaching has to be good, the curriculum has to be good, the learning has to be good, we're going to measure it, and all of that. So their attitude towards it matters greatly in creating the culture. They, I believe as a group, they have a considerable amount of power, if you will, in that they can go to an administrator that perhaps is, you know, is not holding people accountable and simply requesting that that happen. Or they, they, they can go above that and say, look, um, you know, we, I'll go back to, we know what makes the quality school. And if a teacher feels like the curriculum is not being addressed, it's not being modernized, or there's not modern technology or equipment being put in place to support it, they can make a very strong argument to an administrator or a board, if you will, to make sure those things are in place for kids. I mean, I, an example of that would be um, probably 10 years ago now, we started at Central what I call the digital conversion. And essentially what it was is it was the simple, simple way of looking at it is, well, we purchased all the kids an iPad and we gave the teachers an iPad and a MacBook in order for them to author instruction. But that's too simplistic. Because um, if you just give kids an iPad and they don't use it, it's a paperweight. Right. Okay. So it has to be used properly. Uh, what we did is we empowered the teachers to make sure that they knew how to, they had the skills necessary to author instruction using the iPad. So they were trained how to do that. And by doing so, what they were able to do is teach lessons the same uh, sequence that they always did, but now using technical tools to make that happen. You know, it's the end of class and I want to summarize and get a, get, a, you know, see where all the kids are. Well, if I do it digitally, I'll hear all the answers. Bing, 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 bing. They come right in off the iPad. If I'm just asking questions, I can maybe only get to four or five kids. Okay. Right. Well, my point here is this, why did we do that? We are living in a technological age. Every kid, when they go out and get a job, almost every kid is going to have to know technology. Not only the brightest kids and not only the richest kids, but all kids. And for those kids who are perhaps disadvantaged, if the school doesn't do it for them, who is? So in that regard, having the teachers and the administrators go to the school board and say, look, we are graduating a population of students that has to have this technical skill. You have to invest the money to make this happen. That's a very powerful message that a large group can can pull. I love that. Power in, in numbers. Really, really great answer. So we're talking about measuring data. Um, I am not in education, but I often hear people say we should not teach to the tests. We should not teach for these exams. Um, is there some myth in this statement? And as a leader, can you explain to us how you react to that statement? So there's absolutely a myth to that, and I'll, I'll try to explain the best I can. Um, when you say you should not teach to a test, you're wrong. You're just flat out wrong. But the problem becomes, and I was referring to this earlier, you're sitting in class and have this great discussion on the Constitution, and then here comes the test, and it's true, false, true, false, fill in the blank, multiple choice, multiple choice. In other words, lower level assessment to what you were hoping was higher level understanding. The problem wasn't the teaching to the test. The problem was it was a bad test. Okay. It was a test that did not measure what you were hoping to measure. So my point is that you should absolutely teach to the test, but the tests have to be high level and have to measure what you really want the students to understand, not just reciting a bunch of, of facts. 
if, if that's what your test is, then teaching to the test is bad. But if you have a high level assessment that really gets in to an understanding of what the kids should know and be able to do, then teaching to the test is exactly what you should do. And it goes to that point I was making earlier, quality curriculum, well taught with high level of assessments. Straight into the point. I like that. <laughs> so um, listen, I, I spent uh, four years in Roxborough, which is in the Philadelphia School District. Um, and I spent a decade in Allentown when, and I lived right in the West end of Allentown and it was right on the edge of Parkland school district, which is one of the wealthiest and a very, very large school district in the state of Pennsylvania. And just across 17th street, it was Allentown Allen school district. Okay. Um, during COVID every student in Parkland school district had the technology like you just mentioned. I don't believe hardly any, I would say 90% of the students in Allentown, Allen School District, a couple, one block separates them, did not have the technology necessary for them to continue their education during COVID. How is there such a gap in, in, in the United States, in our state of Pennsylvania, and within the same city? And as a leader, how do we close that gap? Chan, I think you're. I think this can be broken down a couple of ways, uh, but there's a couple of issues here. The first one is the thing I was referring to earlier regarding just like the digital conversion we did at Central, and investing the resources necessary to teach the students. So if I were living in Allentown, Allen, if I were a parent or an administrator, or a teacher, or whatever, I'd be going to my school board and say, "Look, it, it's the year 2024." The kids entering kindergarten now are going to graduate in like the year 2039, okay, 2037, whatever it is. They are going to be in a technological society. I mean, just look around. Um, so if, that, if we are going to do our job as a public school and meet our mission, which is to pre prepare our students for whatever is next, we have to give them the resources to do that. So you, I mean, you just have to find the money to invest in that type of thing. Um, it, but it has to be done correctly. As I was referring to earlier, it can't just be hand the kids an iPad and expect them to learn. There has to be part of the curriculum and part of the instruction that embeds that, um, that, that technology in, in just systemically what they do. Now, I think the other thing you're referring to, and this, of course, is where it came out in COVID, is broadband, you know, broadband access in the home. I mean, we're in central. Cl I live on 35 acres in the woods. If you look out the window here behind me, all you're going to see is woods. OK, um, so broadband is absolutely an issue. What we did at Central, and you heard me refer to the digital conversion, then it was 10 years ago. Well, rural broadband wasn't any better then. It was certainly worse then. We came up with components that, and, and it went to why we purchased what we purchased. And in our, in our case, in those days, it was iPads and MacBooks and that type of thing. The reason we did that and the way we trained our teachers was <clears throat> there was a rule. You could not provide the students an assignment for homework. In other words, they were doing it out of school that they required broadband. That was the rule. So you now may say, well, gee, what value do they have taking them home if you don't require broadband? And we were able to come up with a system where the teacher would download the, the assignment they were going to give during the school day. And what would happen is the school's uh, computers would upload all of that onto the teacher, uh, onto the students' iPads before they left. So they would walk out to the buses and that digital assignment was, was already loaded to their iPad. When they got home, they did not need broadband in order to do it. And, you know, when COVID hit, Central Columbia missed one day of school to prepare. One. Not months because their technology was already thought through to the point where it did not require broadband in order for it to work. Wow. Having said that, we are certainly, you know, hoping to make strides on rural broadband. I mean, what I do now, I'm kind of involved with that a little bit, trying to make it better in Columbia County, but it's going to take time and it's going to be incremental. Okay. I love it. Um, so, so 
you know, I, I was listening to some of your previous conversations, even with Tony DeRay, and, you know, he had mentioned on his uh, podcast, which I believe is stretching on Tuesdays, um, that you're a math whiz and you ran the school district like it was in the private sector. Um, yes. For other leaders, you know, in education, can you elaborate on what that means and, and, and kind of tell us maybe some of the ways that that worked for you? There were a lot of, there's a lot of tentacles to that. You know, I can look at a lot of things. Um, for example, when we did our budgeting process, uh, our budgeting was all based on what is our, what is our vision? What is our mission? And what do we need in terms of finances to make the mission happen? Uh, we did not look at it as a, well, we got this last year, so we're doing it this year. The, I'll, get, I'll give you an example. When we did the digital conversion, our paper budget dropped 90% because we flat out said, if, if we're going to do the digital conversion, if we're going to push things over onto digital content for students, we don't need paper. And I know it's easy to go down to the copy machine and run your tests through the copier, but we're not doing that anymore. And we would we would take money from certain budgets and then apply them to more you know technologically based budgets and that type of thing. So that was one example. Another example is we were talking about um, you know the evaluation of teachers, and we would go in and we would collect data. We would take an iPad in with us and we would observe and we would collect specific data on the teacher. We would send it to them, and we would we would. Um, analyze that both individually and in the aggregate. So what do I mean by in the aggregate? You know, schools talk all the time about, oh, we have an in-service day and what do we do? Well, we knew what we were gonna do because we looked at our data and saw where we were most weak and then focused on that particular area. We would also customize professional development for teachers. We would say, hey, you have a day where you have to uh, come up with a plan that focuses on your weaknesses not everybody's, yours. And if you can't figure it out, by the way, I'll show you the data. Okay. Uh, when we would come up with a student uh, schedule, the student schedule, of course, would focus on, you know, academic coursework and so forth. But then there would be a period in the day where all the data we would collect on the student, if we found there was a weakness, we could focus on that weakness. And again, it was based on uh, specific data. Uh, I'm trying to, th there, here, here's another example. And, and, you know, so you're negotiating with teachers, you know, and teacher contract, and of course it's money, it's benefits and all of that. Well, um, you know, we've always had a $250 deductible and, you know, the school district always pays the increases. Well, Central Columbia today, and this has been true for probably a dozen years, has a high deductible, you know, it's a $4,000 family deductible, picture a school district that has that, okay, but Central's had it for 10 years, um, and a HSA, health savings account component, that's part of that. Now, what's, you think to yourself, well, gee, that's common in the private sector that they do that. It's not at all common in schools. Well, how did a guy like Harry convince the school district to do that and the, and the teachers? First of all, the culture, but second of all, we convinced them that if I have a dollar, I would rather pay to buy the students an iPad because it had actual benefit to our vision and mission than to send it to Capital Blue Cross. <laughs> a better use of that dollar was spent on our mission than on something that had nothing to do with our mission. So, like I said, we 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 ans we asked ourselves those questions all the time. How can we do it better? How can we collect data? How can we be more efficient? And those are some examples. And those are great examples. And I, I really appreciate you sharing that with us. So my next question is actually a perfect transition. So it was, you know, you're you were kind of ahead of your time with your obsession and your focus on data. Like in 2024, like in the private sector, we we live, like that's our life, you know? It's transcended athletics, you're a former coach. I mean, you'll hear everybody say the analytics guys, right? But but there's a reason why, you know? Um, so what was that inside of you that, you know, believed in the use of data uh, kind of before everybody else was, was really buying into it? 
Bucknell. So when I went to Bucknell, I uh, math was part of my, I actually started as an engineering student and uh, that, that wasn't going to work. So went over to education and then ended up with a lot of math, including statistics and so forth. And one thing is that my dad was a high school teacher, a social studies teacher at Warrior Run. And when I switched majors, he's like, you know, while you're at Bucknell, you're going to avail yourselves to some of the things Bucknell offers. And that included, I took courses not only in math and education, but also in management, in economics, in accounting, uh, of course, statistics, part of math. So all of those things kind of contributed to this sense that um, data can be really important in, um, you know, giving you a background to make decisions. And, and kind of how I came to this is one day I was sitting in the doctor's office. Now, we've all been to the doctor's office. Well, you sit there, well, you go in, and, and before you ever see the doctor, there's this whole data collection process that happens. And, of course, we don't think of it, but here it is. They take you in, they take your blood pressure. Then they take your pulse. Then they take your respiration, which are all numbers. Then it's height and weight. Then it's things like, well, where does it hurt? How do you feel? Well, they're collecting data that when the doctor walks in, all of a sudden that data is used to help um, determine, you know, to analyze what's wrong and what do we do? Well, think of, think of a kid going through the school system. Okay, that's a kid going through the school system. Well, are they good at writing or good at reading? Are they good at math? Um, and if they're good at math, are there parts they're good at and parts they're not good at? Right. So I'll, I just simply felt that if I collected that data, I could do a better job individually helping every single person in the system. We know they're all different. Uh, we know there's a core that they should know, uh, but I want them to be motivated to come to school. I want them to be motivated because when they get there, you know, they know there's people addressing their exact needs. So I just kind of took this love for math and data, recognized the value it would have in a business sense and tried to apply it to an academic sense. Yeah. And I love that. And, and like for, it, for me, right. Um, I've had some significant health challenges as well as, you know, I'm an entrepreneur and the quicker the data, those flags happen, the better, right? So if we catch a kid in second grade who the data is telling us is behind, that's significantly better than if we don't catch it until sixth grade. Same thing with your health, right? They want to catch that sooner. So um, in my business as well, that data will tell us, hey, this needs to be addressed now. Uh, maybe we would have still figured it out later, but the sooner the better. So uh, I'm a big believer in it and um, I, I really appreciate that perspective. Um, next Great question. Example. Great. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So um, next question I have is, how do you manage a relationship with your board? We talked about managing the relationship with the teachers. We talked about how teachers can keep administrators uh, accountable. Explain the importance, uh, especially at the superintendent role, of not only the board managing you, but you managing the board. This is a great question, and there's a lot of nuance to this, um, but it's incredibly important. Because if the board does not support you, you can't get anything done. Um, you know, you can't be in a position for 19 years if you have a, you know, a clash with the board in your third year. That you know, so it's it's critically important. So first of all, I think what most people would not see is the the communication that occurs between a superintendent and the board. It is ongoing. It is two way. Um, I would say I spoke with every board member at least once a week. Uh, sometimes it was written, but usually it was a phone call. And those types of things were necessary just to establish the relationship, which is incredibly important. But also I can hear from them and I can explain things to I, I can explain things to them. I always took the approach that uh, so, uh, you know, board members are there for, uh, a, you know, a good reason. They want to help the community. They want to serve the public. They want to do all of that. But what they aren't generally are acad or, uh, educational experts. I am. That's what they hired me for. So, and I, I try to not forget that. So 
what I would do is I assumed that I would be the uh, advisor to the board that I was going to, and a teacher of the board. Like if there was a certain curriculum we wanted to put in place or a digital conversion, we wanted to do this, I would present to them exactly the reasoning behind it, how it was good academically, how it could be financed. I would, I would become a teacher of the board. I would of course let them ask their questions. Um, of course, one of the problems with being a math person is you try to apply logic. And if their logic was better than your logic, you would lose the argument. You would like concede. <laughs> um, but, but I all I never acquiesced the the advisory role to them. They could ask questions. They could say, well, you know, maybe we ought to do this. And there's a lot of times you would listen to that. There, there were great ideas that came out. Um but but what I you know we used to we used to have the uh, um, saying that if we got into a tight budget situation and it came down to picking this or this, who should be the one that recommends it? Do we want the board to recommend or do we want us to recommend? Because if there's a difference, that difference probably has something to do with the education of the kids. So we always tried to be proactive and lead and all of that, yet also keep the relationships such that board members certainly could weigh in. And, you know, and there were times where you just flat out said, you know what, better in the long term if we do it the way they want to do it. But we tried to, it's certainly a two-way communication. Yeah. Well, great question. And, and, and it's just something that, you know, most of us have never lived, but it's an important part of making, you know, a school as good as Central Columbia um, has been. And, and you were a big part of that. Um, I have one more question for you. Um, I, I heard you speak about groupthink and the Abilene paradox. Um, yes. Why is that so important? And to me, this is important because um, in the in the age of social media, I think groupthink is actually riskier than it's ever been. I think you can find somebody promoting that groupthink a lot easier. So for the listeners who we're all trying to improve our leadership, tell us about why you love the Abilene Paradox and 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 why groupthink isn't always a, a, a great thing. When I get to the end of this, I can give you two examples of what you're just referring to, how the, how social media negatively affects this. So the Abilene Paradox was an article that I got in Management 101 at Bucknell in 1981, required reading as part of this class. And what the Abilene Paradox is, is about this uh, group that, you know, it's a, it's a family and they live in Texas and it's a hot summer day and there, you know, it's four or five of them in the house and there's nothing to do. It's a Sunday afternoon, they're bored. And one of them says that, you know, they didn't really want to do it, but they said, you know what, how about we drive to Abilene today? Because we're all bored. And Abilene was 100 miles away. Well, they didn't really want to go, but they just said it just to say something. Well, the next person who doesn't want to go either says, well, yeah, sure. Well, all before you know it, all of them say, yep, let's drive to Abilene. And no one wanted to do it. So the gist of the Abilene paradox is, a group of people can all agree to do something that none of them think is a good idea, okay? Well, sure enough, they drive to Abilene, it's hot, it's dusty, the car breaks down, they get home that night, they're all mad at each other. Well, I don't know why you wanted to go to Abilene, I didn't wanna go, and it turns out nobody wanted to go, right? They just didn't communicate. So why is this an important story? So as a leader of an organization, now keep in mind, as a superintendent, yep, you have the school board, but you also day in and day out, you have all the, you know, you have all the principals and curriculum directors, special ed director, facilities manager, you have all the, you have a leadership group. And then of course you have teachers who are experts in their field. You have all these people who are resources if you use them, right? So when we would have an administrative staff meeting, that we would all be present because everyone had a unique perspective of these things. Uh, even if it's just somebody who's looking at it as a taxpayer role, you know, you want that voice at the table. So my position always was, I'm gonna throw out an issue and I'm just gonna sit back and kind of coordinate the debate. But I wanted the debate to happen. I wanted people to feel like they could say, no, I, I yes, this is what I think is right. But this person to say, um, no, 
I, I don't agree or I partially agree because in the end, the solution to the problem probably isn't solely what this person feels or this person feels, it's somewhere in the middle. Well, if groupthink occurs, this minute this person says this, oh, well, they all agree. Well, now you don't find the best solution. Or here's what's worse. The leader who throws out the problem and then says, oh, by the way, this is what I think. Because it, unless, the, unless the environment's right, now everybody goes, oh, yeah, 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 yeah you're, you're right. And you're probably wrong. Because again, the solution's probably in the middle. So to me, the Abilene paradox and the reason, and, you know, I would hand the article out and we would talk about it. You know, the reason it was so important is because I wanted to create this environment where the debate happened and I would manage the debate. And then in the end, we would come to what we thought was the best solution after we've heard from everybody with the hope that they didn't just blindly agree with each other. So I told you there were some examples. So um, I, I recall, so back in 2017, 18, there was a school shooting in Parkland, Florida. And it was, of course, it hit everybody very hard and made us reflect. And the state government in Pennsylvania put a lot of resources into providing schools with grants to essentially harden the facilities. And what you saw at that point was a tremendous uptick in school police officers, resource officers to protect the kids. Okay, well here, so that happens and everybody is applauding it as a good thing to protect the students of our schools. And now it's two or three years later and we're having these uh, riots around the country. And all of a sudden I'm on social media and I'm reading superintendents post things like, oh my God, we really shouldn't have police in schools because you know there's this debate about whether police are good or bad. Hold it. Whoa, don't jump on the bandwagon that's going in a certain direction. We know the funding for school security was a good thing. Don't suddenly, just because there's a there's pressure going in a direction that you suddenly reverse course. So right. there's an example where I thought school, um, or I'm sorry, social media and kind of the you know, the chasing of the emotions was a bad thing. Right. And that's a great example. And I'll be honest, it takes such a good leader to put your ego aside and don't say, Hey, I have the answer. Right. I, I try that with our team every week in our meetings. And, and I appreciate hearing that from you. And I think all of the leaders listening to the podcast, if we're going to take one thing from what we're learning from Harry Matthias, the, you know, the Abilene paradox and the group think and allowing others to weigh in in healthy conflict, right? We're not going to scream our head off at each other, but Hey, I'm going to challenge you a little bit. Right. And it takes, it takes me back to sports, right? There's such emotion in sports and like, I want to challenge my other coaches. I want to challenge my players and they want to be challenged and it's okay. You know, and, and you're in that battle together and it's going to get heated, but you know what? Some of my, I'll give you an example. My partner, I, I own a, a, a Medicare brokerage and my partner in that uh, was a teammate of mine at Susquehanna university. I played basketball and his name's Eric Gilroy. We would literally fist fight each other. We would, but you know what? We also hug it out and it was like, I'm closer to this guy that I almost just punched in the face than I am anybody, anybody, because we are able to be so honest with each other that like we, we have each other's back, right? It's, it's okay to have that healthy conflict. So I really, really appreciate that perspective. What an interview with Harry Mathias, Chad, what are your thoughts? It's always a pleasure to have guests on our, uh, our, uh, little podcast here, but I, I, Mr. Matthias was fantastic. You get to learn so much and, and it's all, you know, continuing to educate yourself, continuing to learn and uh, coming from a guy like him uh, with his words of wisdom really means a lot. Yeah. And, and here's the thing I took from him. One is uh, he created a culture of accountability right? Everybody thinks that, you know, we can't hold people accountable anymore. We can't be tough on people. But what happens is, and he mentions this, people just sit back and they watch, right? They watch and say, okay, is Chad doing what he's supposed to be doing? <laughs> Are you, uh, is, is Bobby holding yeah. up his end of the bargain? Is Susie holding up her end of the bargain? And great cultures, those folks take care of each other before it gets to leadership, meaning they're going to hold each other accountable, or at least they a, should. Or they should yeah. in a great culture, right? 
in a negative culture, those people will go and gossip yeah. behind each other's backs. About, not my fault, their fault. Yeah, not my fault. Or they'll point fingers. Or they'll say, oh, well, you know, so-and-so's not doing that. Or administration's not doing that. Or the board stinks. Or the students don't pay attention. Or the parents don't do what they would do. The teachers aren't supposed to do what they're supposed the to te- do. Yeah. Yeah, right. And, and what we learn from Harry is everybody has a part. Parents have a part at home. Teachers have a part at the, in, in the in the school room in the in the classroom. Students have a part in the classroom. Administrators have a part, you know, in their role. School board members have a part in their role, and it doesn't have to be a culture of animosity. So I want to I want to tell a little story. I worked at AT and T in a union environment, and and I still don't know. You know, there's there's people who are anti union. There are people that are pro union. Um, and this comes up in every conversation around schools. Um, as a sales rep, I was 80% of my commission, maybe 85, 85, 80 to 85% of my income was commission, meaning you eat what you kill. My union dues were in some cases significantly higher because the more I sold, the more I paid the union. Right. They but as a, a top performer, I never needed the union. Right? I never needed them. The union was there to support the people who, you know, who were underperforming. Sure. Right? Um, and I'm not saying that's how education is. Right? What I'm saying, though, is that it's a very difficult environment. And, and folks clash because you have administrators who are non-union and you have you know, employees who are union. Right. It's a it's a very difficult environment. And Harry figured out a way to get everybody to buy in. And that's the key lesson I learned from Harry is, okay, yeah, I'm going to support your union, but I'm also going to challenge you. Okay, And and both things can be true. And then he said, board, I'm the expert to the Mm -hmm. board. And then he said, administrators underneath me, I'm going to hold you accountable, too. As long as everybody's been being held accountable. The culture thrives. It's easier said than done, but that's exactly right. If you stay in your lane, traffic moves smoothly. Yeah. Yeah. Does it not? It does. And and that's the other thing I'll tell you. Like, how about his, uh, when he talks about the uh, Abilene paradox and groupthink? Like, that was fascinating to me. So, like, we need to not do what everybody else does. You and I have done this as entrepreneurs. All the time. So we, we are anti group think. Like yeah. we probably have some sort of oppositional defiance disorder, right? There's we don't, something wrong with us. Right. We yeah. don't we can't be managed by people's. But but you know, I think some folks can learn from us. Like, don't be afraid to speak up. You know, like I'll be honest, like I, I'm one of those people and I try to teach my kids this, like I could care less what everybody else does. I could care less. Right. I don't care what you what you what you think I should do, and I don't care what you do. I'm staying in my lane, and you're the same way, right? Exactly. What, why, why do we do that? Do you know? I, I don't know. I, I think it's just easier to stay out of everybody else's way, right? I, that's just me. I look for simplicity. Yeah. I, you know, I, I don't care what anybody else. If it's not affecting my life or my way of thinking or my uh, day-to-day operations, if it's not affecting any of that, you can do whatever you want. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I just, I agree with you. I man. don't know, but, but that's the one thing I'm going to learn from him is we need to be anti group think like we, everybody needs to be able to have a say, everybody's say means something, but we can't just all agree, uh, you know, to, you know, do what everybody else is doing, especially in, in 2024 and be accountable. Exactly. It's easy. It's yeah. easy to be accountable. It's easy. So listen, the leadership topic of the day, um, is, lifelong learning. And I think what we learned from Harry is he's a lifelong learner, right? He's still learning today. He's retired and he's coming on our podcast to continue to educate us and learn alongside of us. So I have a few things that I've aggregated to become a lifelong learner. Here we go. So one is you need to nurture a growth mindset. What does that mean? You you need to always be learning. And in my industry, right? Literally each week, things change. Like Google literally just rolled out one of their core updates. It's their March core update. Like we're, we have to continue to learn about that to make sure that we're on the top of our game. I think it's super important to be curious, to learn more. You need to incorporate reading into your daily routine, learn something new. 
I don't care if it's five pages. Read about something, learn about something, put it into your to your to your calendar to be a lifelong learner. Okay. Nurture your passions. I love to golf. You like to golf. Love right? golfing. The reason why I love to golf is I've been playing it since I'm 12 years old and I'm still learning new shots. Oh, sure. Yeah. I'm still learning new shots, like open your club face a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, hit your 60 degree from here. Maybe hit a punch shot. Maybe try to spin it. Maybe hit a cut. Maybe hit a draw. <laughs> right. There's so much to learn. Yeah. You're going to have a shot where the green's going away from you. Right. You've probably never hit it. You have to try to flop it up and, and make something happen that you've never done before. I love learning about my passion, which is golf. Okay. Understand the need for self-improvement. Right. We, we, we can't just be like, oh, like even us. Oh, we're entrepreneurs. We're done. Oh, yeah. Well, that's removing your ego. Yeah. Like I just watched you guys out here in the studio taking a picture of a microphone. Yeah. Product shots. You literally changed the lighting 800 times <laughs> in the 10 minutes I was here yeah. to just get the perfect shot. And you were learning about bouncing the light off of different areas. Yeah, right? I was just trying something new for the first time. But it's trial and error, right? But you, you have to continue to do that. But you're not like, I'm the expert. This is how we do it. I am not the expert in anything. Yep. I am humble enough to say that. Yeah. <laughs> I, so, so those are a few tips uh, to be to continue to be a lifelong learner, Chad. And uh, listen, I appreciate you guys joining us today. Anything else, Chad? No, but you want to go trout fishing with I, me. So you you were following the you were following the stock trucks. So you know where all the fish I are, right? I, well, I I might know a few spots. I don't know all the secrets. Uh, I am certainly not a pro fisherman by any stretch of imagination. But I I I was always a fisherman. Ever since I was six years old, I'd, okay. I'd go fishing all the time, but I'm no pro at it, but you might see a new, uh, uh, YouTube channel coming your way. All right. So here's the deal. I, <laughs> for you fishermen I was, I that want to learn. I, 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 my, my father-in-law, my brother-in-law are great fishermen and my son is also a very good fisherman. I'm still on the learning curve. So I'm just learning kind of where to cast. I'm learning how to read the water. Mm -hmm. I can't fly fish yet. I can throw a spinner. Uh, but I'll be honest, there's nothing like catching a fish. It's, well, it's nothing like being out there to yeah. catch a fish. So it's not about catching a fish. It's about who you're trying to catch the fish with. Yeah. So I'll give you an example. We just, uh, in Jamaica, you know, we took the Lauer media team there for a retreat and we booked a fishing charter, Ooh. but my son watches Steven Ranella, who's called it's meat eater. He's very famous. Oh yeah. So when Graham is <laughs> along, he's eight. When he's along, we have to eat the fish we catch. He doesn't let you, everybody's like, ah, I don't know if I want to eat these. And he's like, no, we're eating them. Right. And in Jamaica, they don't, th they just put the whole fish right on the grill. Yeah. Right. And then you just kind of scrape the meat off. Yeah. So we're sitting there at the restaurant with just, you know, all these fish. We had strawberry grouper. You asked for a strawberry all, grouper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There it is right on your plate. Yeah. And the, <laughs> the presentation was awesome, but like what an experience to eat lunch. Yeah. Uh, uh, and you're eating what you caught. Yeah. It's just, it's really, really fabulous. Yeah. So again, learning about different cultures, learning about how they cook their fish, learning about how they eat their fish, learning about how to catch a new fish, lifelong learning, right? And, and, and I'll leave you with this. I, you don't have to travel outside of the country. You can literally just drive to like Philadelphia and experience a different culture, right? If you travel, you're going to learn so much about life, right? Yeah. In Philadelphia, you know, you go into Northeast Philly, it's different than central, you know, central Philadelphia, but like that's the fifth largest, largest city in the country. The, there's the art museum, there's the Rocky statue, there's so much to learn in Philadelphia. So let's travel, let's be lifelong learners. And we really appreciate Harry Matthias joining us today. Can't wait to get started on the next one, Chad. Are you a business owner, a leader, or an aspiring achiever looking to turn life's challenges into powerful fuel for your success? You've come to the right place. Get ready to unlock the secrets to turning life's hardships into your most powerful ally. Your hosts, along with our incredible guests, will help you tap into your own Lauer power and guide you towards the success you've always dreamed of. 